Hello. Uh, welcome to another museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, president and chief instigator of POW, Paul Orselli Workshop, here on Long Island. And I am super pleased to be joined today by Seb Chan, all the way on the other side of the world, the digital connection here, uh, which is very apropos to our conversation. But before we start that, um, I always like to have people talk a little bit about their background. So hi, Seb, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about how you got to where you are now. <laughs> yeah, hello, Paul. Thanks heaps. It's, it's uh, the morning here in Melbourne. So I'm um, at the uh, CXO, uh, so the Australian Centre for the Moving Image in Melbourne. Um, I guess I started my um, museum career uh, bizarrely coming out of music and uh, media and, uh, and IT. And so I started work at the Powerhouse Museum in Sid Sid Sydney at the end of last century, actually the very end of last of a cent century working on a Y2K project. So, you know, that, that the, the one of the other big things that uh, could have affected the world and because of really good planning didn't as much as it perhaps might, might have might have some lessons for today's world, perhaps, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, so I uh, started out in museums through IT and project management and doing those sort of things with computers. Um, and I, I've been very involved in first, first, firstly, the open ac access part of museum worlds, uh, coming into museums and seeing all the treasures that they, they held and the limit, limitations of exhibits and physical galleries to make those of the, those available and accessible to to people at the same but same time as museums embracing the web and the potential in the mid to two thousands of social media uh, social media and the social web. Um, I guess I became known for doing a lot of uh, pioneering work in that field around museum collections. Um, and then at the end of or the beginning of the twenty tens, I moved to new. Uh, New York uh, was hired by the Smithsonian to uh, work on the digital side of the reboot of the Coop, of the Cooper Hewitt, the National uh, Smith, the Smithsonian Design Museum. Um, so I was there for four years, and then I came uh, came to back to Australia for a, for, a, for, a, for a job in Melbourne, where, as I said, I'm the CXO at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. Um, so my teams now, you know, I'm one of uh, the senior exec senior executive roles in the organisation. Um, so we have three divisions of um, the museum: broad, broad, broadly uh, programming and curatorial, and commercial and operations. And my air my areas, which are experience and engagement, which include everything from uh, marketing, communications, design. Uh, di digital and product and experience, uh, visitor experience, um, ICT, uh, but also collections and preservation, given that we have moving image and digital collections. So my experience in digital collections and di di digital preser preservation um, informs that. And for the last couple of years, actually, since I started, we've been doing this big, again, reboot of a museum. So coming in, we've, we closed about a year a year ago um, after uh, doing a lot of work with, with government to raise the funds to do a $40 million redevelopment of this site in central Melbourne. Um, we uh, were about to reopen and now with um, COVID-19, we are doing other work and, and working on that, um, working on other things uh, whilst also working it towards a future future um, reopening once we can um, and it's been really interesting I guess looking at what a digital museum can be and now has got now has got to be and my other back background which really ran through all of the 1990s and the two, 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 2000s uh, and it's re rebooted a little bit since I moved back to, to Australia has been in music so I've been in electronic music and and electronic art, um, digital art for you know since really 1990, um, and in public radio. So I uh, did a public radio show for about um, uh, 20 years, uh, broadcasting experimental music and club music 
uh, in various public radio stations in Sid Sydney and organising festivals, uh, running a record kind of label, running a music, music, music magazine, those sorts of things. And I guess those sorts of ac activities were running parallel with my museum life. And as the 2000s wore, wore on, they interwove more and more and more and more. And I began to realise a lot of the work I was doing in the 1990s where I was at, when I was at university, um, where I was studying social, social work and then doing a PhD kind of a D on sub, subcultures, subcultural geography. So the question I was exploring at that point in the mid kind of 90s was what were the particular affordances of cities that allowed certain sounds to build roots and build communities around them. And it took a long time. It took maybe 10 years for me to realise that was exactly the same work that I was doing in muse museums. And there was a lot of parallels there. And I could draw on a lot of that research work that never got finished because life and because the internet and because museums, in fact, bizarrely, got in the way. Um, became a really good way of in informing the practice. And I guess as, as I've got older, um, uh, I've begun to see more ways that those uh, paths converge. And also it's been interesting to watch the way mu uh, music has evolved with digital and the internet. Um, and maybe that offers lessons to museums, but also to every, to, to every other form, particularly as you, know, you and I have spoken a lot in the past about how museums are media and media is museumified as well. And there's different things we can take from those. And I guess those things have interested me for a long, long, long time. And even in the publishing world, all the stuff I was publishing in terms of running a, running a magazine and all of that, I was doing that. Um, so the, this magazine I was running began as a flyer for this club that I was running with, with some friends that ran each week in Sydney for a decade. And it was a, this club night that became um, quite well known and all the arts, art school kids used, used, used to come along to it was kind of a hip thing for different moments in, in, uh, in its life to different communities of people. Um, and the magazine began life as a flyer. So it was like, well, what if the magazine was free? So like zines, we'd grown up with zines. And so this notion, notion of giving away con content for, for free in service of another purpose, which was to get people to come to the club, but also to build a shared knowledge around that, that, that club um, became kind of a thing. And I think that reflected in the open access work in the mid to, to 2000s, nearly a decade later. But then when that, when that um, magazine received Arts Council fund, funding in 2000, and that we got that money for probably about four years, I think, and, you know, it became more of a business, for want of a better word, or an arts business. Um, we still gave away the magazine free, and the magazine was also a free free PDF and was also free on on kind of the web. And it was like this sort of the container, the physical printed magazine, was what people wanted to collect and what people could pass to a friend to share. Whereas the on kind of on kind of line version or the PDF version was the one that was accessible to people all over the world, but didn't have that physicality to it. So it was, you know, I think in the museum work that that, that I've been involved with since the magazine and since all the other things, that sense of the physicality being in, being in, being in, being important, but having different affordances has been key to, I guess. How I think about the world, and, and cert certainly how I think about um, the difference between a physical museum experience in in a in a building, in a gallery, in an exhibit, to a digital museum experience. What are the things that are good in one area, uh, what, what, that are possible in one, that aren't possible possible in the other, without trying to slavishly replicate one into the other world? Yeah, it's it's interesting the the threads that connect all your. <laughs> All your different worlds. I mean, w one is the is the sharing aspect. I think, and the the making things available in different ways and in different modalities. That's super interesting. But also this distinction, not only that you draw, but users draw between digital versions of things and physical versions of things, and whether 
they serve different purposes and 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 how and why and maybe that's a good segue into um Seb Chan's <laughs> version of the digital museum. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, I think now it's really interesting here. We're recording this during a time where everybody's working from home and zooming and connecting and a lot of museums, since they can't be physical places now, are putting lots of stuff online. Um, there's an open question as to whether people want it or not, or whether they've even bothered to ask people if they want it or not. That's a whole different story. But um, I, I guess maybe you you could talk about your experiences, especially in the museum world, and what you think, um, well, your crystal ball is no clearer than mine, but what what <laughs> what what we sort of learned from what we've already been doing, and maybe what, we should be thinking about in the so-called new normal post COVID-19. Yeah, it's, it's interesting now because there's been a real boom in virtual exhibitions, you know, these, these virtual gallery tours that really to me feel like a, an art, artifact of the late sort of 1990s. And certainly one of the first projects I worked on at the powerhouse was a virtual reconstruction of um, the Olympic um, arm of Olympia in Greece, which was part of an exhibit for uh, the Olympic Games in 2000, which happened in Sid Sid Sydney. And it was interesting to see the te technologies used then that were these ones that were, uh, you know, creating spherical images, which you can now do with a phone, but then took a lot of special lens lenses and then people doing special stitching in Photoshop to make the spherical, you know, all that stuff and a, a viewer that used Java and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, those virtual tours, you know, they, they really were quite the thing in the late 90s, early to 2000s. And then with the social, social web, they really faded away. And I think people didn't, um, that, people got drawn to the other elements of digital when social, or the web when social became a thing. And so it's been fascinating to see this return to uh, virtual gallery tours and every museum it seems is, which is closed, is spinning up these virtual, virtual gallery tours, which of course have no people in front of, of them, you know, you know, whether it's on Google Arts and Culture or whether it's on a museum's own website, if they can afford to, to kind of do that. I've been seeing some, quite well made ones using a system called Matterport recent kind of Lee and including ones that are sort of virtual virtual tourism and in fact I guess that's what that's what's been interesting to see is that what we're actually seeing with these virtual museum tours that are coming up now is virtual virtual tourism not actually what we thought was being made previous previously which were these what I would guess would be called virtual exhibitions in that they were also trying to communicate some of the edu the, ed the educational um, outcomes that you might try to achieve through, through building a physical exhibit too. So this virtual tourism that, that it seems to be a, a desire now because you can't leave kind of your, your home, I think is actually a very fleeting user need. Um, and what we're gonna be left with is a whole, whole, whole lot of gallery tours that don't have any visit, visitation, that, that are just going through a little um, spike now because people can't go to the park or can't, you know. And, and, and I imagine virtual tours of other places, of scenic sites are also booming um, but now too, just because they're not accessible physically. So- I, uh, although, although I wonder about that, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like, um people are making, per per I mean, it's interesting. I, I have to think about this. It doesn't seem like there are lots of virtual tours of parks or, or things that maybe are still inaccessible. It seems like there's this uh, big push by museums and cultural institutions like, oh, we need, this is, we need to do this. People need to come there, but it, it, it's sort of this pseudo thing. I mean, visiting uh, museums course, yeah. is such a social, aspect and even the virtual thing is removing the social aspect from from the visit totally the the the, the um sort of anti-social and anti-septic 
a virtual virtual tour without any anyone there is a very interesting um, phenomenon to experience. And I guess, um, yeah, I mean, as I say, those seem to be uh, a, a happy accident. I guess is that they're easy ish for museum people who have not engaged necessarily deep, deeply with the internet or what the internet might mean for them over a long period of time. It's quite an easy thing to say, let's, let's throw some money at doing that. It, people seem, seem to want it. But I guess my point is that that, is, that seems to be driv, driven at the consumer end or the user end by some different motivations that don't align necessarily with what the museum might think it is actually doing by making uh, with that. And I've, so the other side is, of course, the other piece that's going on, which is, well, a multi, multi, multi-faceted piece, which is the information dump. All the museums now are information dumping everything it, they You made me touch my about. face. You made me <laughs> touch my face. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the stuff that is now being put on online it's actually like this should have been on museums websites for the last 20 years. Yeah, all those education kits, all those craft PDFs that the educators were printing off to do in their physical work workshops, those should have been on the museum's website in the first place. Um, and I guess the del the del deluge of that is is telling in that there was really little reason they weren't there before other than perhaps time and incentive. Um, and um, now with this del, uh, de, del, uh, deluge is that again, like museum collections, you need people to help you navigate through them. Just putting the stuff there isn't enough. You need ways to curate paths through it. And, and I think um, many places from the Smithsonian through to some of the work I did at the powerhouse, making education portals and things like that, there, there was never a shortage of material. What there was was a shortage of cur curation of that material to make it work for learners, teachers, parents, whatever. Um, there, there's no, you know, so it's, it's interesting to see the floodgates are really opened, but we haven't solved the problems, the real problems, which weren't the shortage of inf information. It was ways to navigate and make, make <laughs> sense of it, you know. Yeah, it's always, um, I mean, it should be about interpretation. I mean, it's interesting if you've got this virtual, let's say, library that has some organizational structure and people can find things and, and actually learn things as opposed to, ah, we have this digital technology. Let's create the infinite museum label, you know, <laughs> like a thousand. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess it, I guess it draws on the sort of, uh, challenges of the of the museum world, but I, but I would say this also applies in the retail space, the tourism space, any really any any space where we've had centuries of engage engagement with physical constraints, um, is that um, most of the work that's been going on in museums in the di digital or the web world um, and in the gallery di uh, the digital world too is has drawn on pre on models that come out of publishing or come out of exhibit making, physical exhibit make, making. And we haven't really seen, really seen yet a digitally nat nat native exhibit. And, and, and so what is a digitally native thing or a network native thing? I think that there, there, there's one element about scale and reach and that, that, that these, the, the power of the internet has been about scale, be it scale of community, um, scale of connection, um, and global scale. And I think you see some of that occurring with some of the work, not all of the work that Google, Google Arts and Culture has previously done. Um, but also I was just thinking back to one of the, you know, key found, you know, foundational texts in what used to be called new, 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 new media art in the late sort of 19, 1990s and Lev Kondramanovich's language of kind of new media where he poses these sort of, notions of what new new media is and this sort of senses of modularity or, or automation variability 
soft software to uh, connect things to, to, together. And I think subsequent to Lev's early work there, which, which was really inf influenced and inspired you know, more than one generation of media artists around that period um, and museums. I mean, my museum in Melbourne in many ways was born out of that era. Uh, it turned from the State Film Centre, which it dates that dates back to the 1940s to the, the institution now at Federation Square, which launched in 2002, was really coming off the back of that new, new, new media arts move, a movement of the 1990s, early net art as well. And, and, and I guess that modularity, or automation, variability, and there are several, uh, several, yeah, several others that Matovich talks about in that book which is upstairs somewhere in my pile of shell we'll, bookshelves. We'll, we'll, um, provide, we'll provide a handy link in the YouTube uh, description. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think, you know, that um, you, you might add now net, network scale. And I think that the modularity, automation and vari vari variability, particularly are the antithesis, I think, of how museums and ex um, um, exhibit designers like your, yourself, but people I work, work, work with um, have traditionally thought about immersive exhibitions. That Im, um, immersive exhibits, you know, we, we think of them as that total work of art, that get some kunst work sort of model engaging all of the senses and the, the total world. We're thinking about world, world building. Um, we're not thinking about modularity necessarily. Uh, we're talking about manual and bespoke things rather than auto automation and we're talking about fixed things fixed in time and space and responding to the fixed characteristics of a particular gallery setting or a particular set of personas of presumed visitors um, the fixedness of that runs counter to the new media sense of variab variability so i think that 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 sort of that's been one of the i guess philosophical challenges for the field is that we haven't there's been a lot of attempts, but we haven't really cracked open that enough. Um, and certainly through, you know, I've been going to museums in the web for, you know, 15 years now. And over that period and reading some of the papers from, you know, which date all of uh, the way back to 1995 or museum computer net networks work going back to the 1960s. None of this is new. It's just never been articulated or it's been articulated but nothing's ever been built so you know there's this sort of gap between theory and practice um and so you know some of the work i i i was doing at the cooper hewitt with the you know the making the database available and interactable within a physical way with the pen and other things in that uh building rebuild with local local projects and your and your work with us then too. You know, that, that was all about linking the physicality of exhibit design and interaction design with the affordances of the network. And as my colleague Aaron, sort of Aaron de Cope, who continues to write about this sort of stuff from San Francisco, um, the airport, the, the airport museum there, it's sort of sense of the, the um, affordances of the net network being merged with what you know, we think, or Aaron and I and many others think, is that public, public, public museums have a responsibility to do, uh, which, which is preserve collections, but connect those collections with the present and with the communities around them. And what better way to do that than with the affordances of the net network coupled with exhibit, good exhibit design that builds those other emotional and... Um, physical tact tactile connections that that are how we create memory as well so anyway but then i think about my music side and i think about how music also you know if we think 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 about how music has tried to adapt to the internet or the net network um we think what is digitally native music what is network native music now and i was think, thinking back to this and you know i i am old old enough to remember the both shock and awe that I had for Nap for Napster when Nap Napster launched, and it was amazing. And you know, I think I was in the early 
adopters of that because, you know, I was in the music world, I was DJing, I was a music collector, you know, all, all of um, um, all of my friends were all your dreams so, come true <laughs> it was amazing but but what i found amazing about it wasn't the access to all the music that i didn't know existed or all the music that i knew but didn't know how to get that 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 was like wow that's amazing but what i thought was really fast fascinating there in fact and i guess the most the the thing that changed how i thought about the world most was the ability to browse what other what other people had, so I could connect to Paul's lib library, you know, Paul Ossili's library of music based on some something that I was looking for, and see all of the other things that he had created a world of music around too. So his world of taste and my my world of taste across continents could be intersecting circles, and we would see the single point or multiple points of connection. And then all of these other bands and albums and, and um, genres that you had thought related that I could then find a way in kind of to. And it felt like a really interesting way of exploring taste. And at the end of the day, cult cultural things tend to be, a, be about taste and the ways to expand people's notions of what 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 they like is about finding i think finding ways to um take the high hierarchies of taste 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 away but also look look for what makes those things specific and ask people why why they love things in a particular way and then yeah. share that love for stuff it's it's uh it seems like that social lens comes into the conversation again and uh, becomes a another way of connecting what again is not what could just be a gigantic information dump but now here's another yeah. way to view it and understand it at, literally on a human scale and that taste aspect and you know finding finding your tribe aspect even if your tribe yeah. is 10,000 miles away from where you are sitting at the moment. I, I think that's really yeah. interesting. So, so go ahead, go ahead. So I guess the digitally native music thing to just poke on that a, that a little bit more. When I think about music today, and I think, think about my kids, teenagers, list, listening to music and have grown, grown, grown up in a household where we playing all sorts of music all of, uh, um, all of the time. And in fact, what's been interesting about this COVID isolation period is we've had less music on in the house generally, but we've had music on our head, head, um, headphones, so private worlds of music more than a shared shared world of music. But so if I think think about digitally native music now, and I was think, thinking about this just, just before this call, it seems that there, there are two new-ish strands here that may offer ways that we might want to think about what digitally native exhibits or other digitally native things might be. One is uh, the TikTok. So the way that TikTok is entirely music based, um, but everything is short, temporary and fleeting. Um, part of that's to do with attention, part of that's to do with rights, and part of that's to uh, to do with the perform the perform the performative nature and the limits that it sets. So I don't really want to want, want a world of music where music is reduced to TikTok, but it feels like the way music is used in that is an interesting network native and high, highly social way of thinking about the utility nature of music in that regard. The second example, of course, is Spotify. So, the, you know, and, and, it, and in fact, if I go back a couple of years, I think there was a couple of papers at museums and the web, or certainly presentations. Um, and there was in fact an article I was reading probably while I was in New, um, New York um, that was from some other museum curator or digital museum person who was also a DJ. And so this sort of sense of uh, music as mood and what Spotify has done which was quite different to Nap Naps Napster was reduced music and that accessibility of everything. Well, in quotes, everything, because it's not everything. And in fact, the best music probably isn't on Spotify, um, is that music gets reduced to mood and, and that utilitarian nature of that 
means that you get music for running. You get music for work, working. You get music for studying, where you are surrounded all of, um, the, um, all of the time by music, but you don't really care about the specificities. It's just how it makes kind of you feel, which on one side you could say is incredibly de democratic and accessible, but what you're getting is cookie cutter cardboard. Even if it's not that, you consume it as if it is, as if it's interchangeable and it doesn't matter who actually made it or the ideas in it, it's what you use it for. Um, and in some ways that's very, liber very liberating, um, but it's also the neo kind of liberal dream of everything being re you know, reduced to commerce. Um, and of course the, the musicians completely lose out there. There's, there's no fans. It's just music as mood. And, and people like Liz Pelly and Matt kind of remember Dryhurst and other music economy art theorists are, are thinking a lot about that. And I, I look to people like that to keep a sense of what are some of the things we can learn from how music has evolved or changed and the music, the commercial music world and how the commercial music world also has changed the way uh, the more niche um, in the kind of um, dependent music worlds that I'm, uh, that I'm involved in, how they need to work. And we can see perhaps similar examples going on in the divide between the contemporary art world of art fairs and the art, and the art market and actually contem um, contemporary creative practice, which is much, much lar lar larger, more diverse, has different in interactions with a much broader sense of economics and markets, but is less represented in, in quotes, museum exhibits. So there's, I, I think there's, there's some lessons to be learnt or some things we might take from how music still has, still hasn't found a digitally native form. Um, and also how, how that makes us feel about things too. I, you know, people often talk about um, wanting art to be everywhere. And, and, you know, when someone goes to, you know, pick a, pick a, global brand kind of you know museum the met moma the louvre wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't it be great if their if their collections were our desk desk desktop backgrounds or our screen or um, our screen kind of savers and and on one hand you're like great more people are seeing it but then it's just spotify it's reduced to mood and there's not um that in that emotional connection which a good exhibition will give uh, a, a, a kind of visitor because I think it's that emotional connection um, that makes people think about change and I think for me museums need to be about how societies mm -hmm. change and they need to ref reflect that those change change changes in critical ways and, and, and help us all be better humans um, on the other hand, you know, you might also say that the, the, the web and digital and the internet and digital museums, just, just as it took a long, a long, long time for film to develop its own language that wasn't the theatre and for TV to develop its own langu languages that wasn't film, reality television maybe goes back to theatre, but whatever, um, those, those things took decades. So... It's it's interesting, yeah. You know, now the web is, you know, from you know, nearly uh, what is it, twenty six, twenty seven years old, or certainly since I first got on the web when I was at uni. So yeah, yeah, early nineties. I uh, made my first website, or whatever. Those things, it's it's twenty five years, you know, it's twenty five or more years. It feels like there's something we still haven't cracked it. Um, I was thinking, I was, I was watching some stuff about, you know, my other part of my work being now working in a museum of the, move, of, um, of the moving image, or as perhaps we might say, museum of screen culture, um, is about video games. And to think about how there's been some really fascinating evolutions in video games, particularly in the open, open world space. So Reddit, Reddit, Reddit Redemption 2, uh, big block, blockbuster title, uh, Death um, and then Death kind of strand, strand, stranding the Hideo Kojima title of last, of, of last kind of year. These are massive multi-million dollar productions, huge, huge teams of workers making them 
you know, like a massive whole, um, whole uh, blockbuster movie type credit scale um, and financial scale too. Those games particularly, I think, have been interesting in their em emphasis on the time spent move, moving about in, uh, in kind of them. Both of them are, are very slow experiences and they're very much about the journey, not the destination. And it's been fascinating to see players get very caught up in how they either hate it or they love it. And I fall in the love category. I like how those games have tried to make the journey between point A and B more important and emotionally interesting than the, des the, the point A's and B's, which feels to me a little bit like an exhibit. So a digital, ex so a web exhibit gets you quickly from, you know, this painting or this, this, his this historical thing to the next one on uh, the website, you can just jump from A to B. Whereas the physical exhibit needs you to walk and notice things along that journey from A to B. And so I wonder whether there's something that can be learned from those video games that um, are designing worlds uh, that, are, um, that, are, that take time to explore. The other one, uh, which my son's just started playing after you know, many years of encouraging him to try it out is Ken, the kind of Pataki route kind of zero, which is really a beautiful um, poetic game. It, it's taken nearly seven kind of years for all the episodes to be finished. I think it began in about 2011, so maybe even more now. Um, it's a beautiful game that's very, very uh, sort of po very poetic and um, highly, um, heavily based on the time, but time between things and the conversations you have with characters and uh, some of the writing about that game particularly really pull, draws on those threads of um, the story being told through the, char the, the characters you, in you interact with. And I was reading a beautiful piece about it the other day that was talking about when you choose to speak to one, 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 one character, you're actually severing the opportunities to take the opposite choices with other characters. So you don't realize that and that and that and that and that until you're quite until you've moved through the story and it's quite a quite a fascinating experience. So so I think there's some stuff in 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 terms of those other digital experiences, video games uh, particularly that that museums could learn a lot from it doesn't mean museums should build video games totally do you do not do that also don't make three three d virtual worlds necessarily unless you are going to make the act of walking interesting um you know that sort of challenge we have street view um or moving through those virtual galleries is is pain is painful because you aren't sensing all the other things you physically sense when you do walk physically through a, through a gallery and that sense of time and space is kind of weird and doesn't work. It, uh, it's interesting when you talk about some of these uh, games and their approaches. Um, it just made me think of Sleep No More, uh, just uh, the idea of really sort of feeling, and that's obviously a physical experience, and in some ways it sort of feels like it could be it could, like somehow you could do things like that in museums where you gave people more autonomy and there are, there are things that they can explore, explore that don't necessarily always have to be driving mm -hmm. a content story or dumping information on people, but just contributing to this whole experience and this mood, which seems like really interesting. Um, yeah. I think I, it's also the presence in those games, particularly in death kind of stranding, the subtle, the subtle awareness of other players that aren't physically present in the world, but they leave their marks on the landscape. Uh, I felt that that was, you know, I, I was very torn in that, that game when I started it. It felt so um, contrived, I guess. But then as I got into the mood of it, um, I ended up playing that game. You know, I think I finished it in like 30, 30, 38 hours in like, two weeks, uh, which for me, when I'm, you know, working a 
you know, a job and other things, fam family and all that. I was doing some pretty long stints in that game. So it had to be pretty compelling. It was incredibly linear. But I think that sort of the way that it did a couple of those things, I think Kojima was very, it, it's very interesting what he's tried to do. And it's, it's by no means completely su successful, but I think there's a lot of interesting ways that game has shown the presence of others without them being competitors in the game or adversaries or whatever you might have in a traditional video game where you're playing against other people or perhaps you're playing with other people against another boss. It's not like that at all. It's a much more subtle presence. It was was actually really good. Um, but yeah, the sense of time and how, how we might acknowledge, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of said in other things and, you know, you, you, you and I have spoke, spoke, spoken about in the past too about the sense of museum visitors when they visit us physically, they're actually giving us their uh, time and we need to honour that time. And, and I've said that we need to multiply the return on that time gift. So if someone gives us an, a one hour, what do we give them back that's worth more than one hour? And I've always seen that as an opportunity to extend things beyond that one hour of time, both in the physical space, but also beyond that, uh, what influence might we have on their lives? If you give me one hour of your time, does it send for you down rabbit holes of another four hours of web browsing? Some point in the future, it doesn't have to be today, but it triggers a bunch of thoughts that makes you go, oh yeah, I haven't forgotten about that. You know, and I think that's, that's a sort of, I think for a lot of museums, now, and nowadays, particularly, it's have become so enmeshed with the tourist economy, which, which, which I think is incredibly fragile in this post-COVID world that's emerging. What is tourism? Are you, are you even then? Um, the museums that have gone very much down the tourist path are heavily exposed, and we're seeing that both in Australia and in America and, in our, and, and Europe and other parts of the world too. Well, I think maybe that's... Uh a thought that I'm, I'm, I think would be a nice way to end on the idea that the time that someone gives us when they make that commitment to visit a museum deliberately pays dividends <laughs> to them in different ways, whether that's digitally and after the physical visit and that, that uh, I think that's a really nice way of thinking about um, a museum visit and that notion of uh, it continuing and, and being multiplied, I think that's a really nice thought. Um, w w one thing, uh, maybe you could, uh, this, this whole conversation uh, strikes me, uh, you, maybe we can give a shout out and also include in YouTube, um, you, you have uh, regular uh, digital conversations via email <laughs> with your email newsletter. So I don't know if you want to just briefly give a shout out to that. And I, certainly we can provide the link uh, in the in the YouTube. But uh, it just seems like sort of an interesting experiment. Maybe you can just uh, finish up and say wh why of all things you did something that's sort of, uh, well, to use a music analogy, sort of lo-fi um, yeah. through email. Yeah, look, I think that news news kind of led has been a private art pro project I've been doing now for about a, just a, just just over for a year, and it's been an interesting an antithesis to social media, and it's been sort of partly about me finding ways to write and slow down thinking about particular things, but also be uh, be a thing that a lot of people, a lot of friends have used me for in the past, which is a recommender. So that sort of sense of can I open up worm, wormholes and can I, some of them are just purely about particular music, others are about video games, others have some intersection with museum stuff, but I always see it as an adjacent practice. So I guess because I've given up DJing simply because I'm in a new, I'm in a new city now, I guess it's a little bit like DJing ideas um, around, around a range of topics. So it's been fun to do. And I think email um, has, it, is a nice persistent, easy form that I guess um, and you know I think early on in you know when museums when museum people were making websites there was a big push to write lots and lots of stuff on the web the web was predominantly a text a textual medium in those very early days 
Um, and then later on in the 2000s, certainly the beginning of the 2010s, there, there was this big push to make everything short form. And then there was that sort of weird thing where we got tricked that video was going to be massive when actually the stats about it were all gamed and, you know, all that stuff, whatever. Um, and long, long form writing disappeared from the web for a while. And I think news, news, newsletters and cert, cert, certainly the ones that I read and um, also the one that I guess I write um, are trying to do something around long, long, long form as a writing pra practice or medium, medium form. They're not that long, but medium, medium form writing that doesn't exist well on the web um, necessarily or doesn't get read on the web versus an email, I have people who read it, who store, store them up and then read five in a row, like once every three months or whatever. And it's interesting to see that I'm, I'm not writing these for people to read tomorrow. I'm writing them for them to read it whenever they're ready for it. And I think that, that sort of sense of patience, I think e email is quite a good patient medium um, in, in, in a way that Twitter and face, Facebook and others, you know, they talk about the, the, um, the, the sort of um, fire hose effect of that or the stream. The, 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 the stream is always about immediacy. And I think email is a form of, of non-immediacy, you know, sort of paused immediacy. So people can get it when they want and that's cool. I also like to make them ephemeral because uh, they're not fully, fully formed notions. And the things that do roll into my work practice end up as work things and become blog blog posts or projects the things that are music things may end up as music writing or other things for other places um, it's it's a scratch pad and I think you know I and others um, others of my friends in the museum museum world have been bloggers for a long 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 time and um, that sort of sense of having a place we can work through ideas in a uh, semi-public space uh, our blogs used to be more semi-public than public really um, and I guess that sort of sense of having um, some some protective cocoon around your early thoughts, uh, but also the affordances of the feed, feed, feedback of a global a global global set of peers. Um, and this one was never intended to just be for museum people. People, and in fact, a lot of the early people who um, decided to choose to read it were actually all of my old music music buddies. So a lot of them have been picking up all these weird ideas about weird museum collections and art and books and stuff and vice versa. So I think that's really nice. You know, I think it's a good thing, but yeah, it's, it's sort of DJing with words. DJing with words. Well, I'm a, I'm a happy subscriber and uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm uh, happy that we had the chance to talk today. It, fe it feels like the, uh, digital Zoom version of you spitting out ideas and sort of, <laughs> ah, now I'll, I'll be like, yeah, I want to think some more about that. So that's great. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I'm also happy <laughs> that uh, the technology between New York and Australia and the, the space and time and time zones cooperated. So- I know, uh, right? We're, 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 we're happy that that happened too. So thanks, thanks very much, Seb. Uh, I'll uh, put the tag on you. We'll see what, what uh, sort of links or uh, references um, you might want to uh, append to this that we can include cool. in the YouTube. So thanks again. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Paul. It's great.